Hello and welcome to Ukraine in Flames, a special project brought to you by Ukraine Crisis Media Center, Ukraine Catholic University's Analytical Center and NGO Euro-Atlantic Course. My name is Alexandra Tsakhanovska and as a head of Hybrid Warfare Analytical Group at Ukraine Crisis Media Center, today I will walk you through the discussion that so many of us can personally relate to, that is, how do Ukrainian refugees settle in the Western host countries? communities. More than 3 million people have left Ukraine uh, since the start of Russian large-scale invasion in February this year, and more than 10 million people in total have been displaced, uprooted from their homes. Half of this large number is kids who are often separated from their fathers and now struggling to feed into the new, often challenging environments. Western host communities do their best in order to make this environment as safe and as comfortable comfortable as possible, both for the kids and for their parents abroad. So this is a topic that's definitely worth a discussion because along with the positive aspects, there are also many challenges that we cannot disregard. So let's get rolling. Uh, and we start with um, the director of European Academy in Berlin, Germany, who shares both personal and professional opinion uh, on how the European societies handle the largest influx of refugees since World War II and uh, what was happening in the first days after the invasion. Hi, my name is Veronica. I'm working for the European Academy Berlin, and this is my comment on Ukraine in flames, how the Ukrainian refugees settle in Western host communities. February 24, 2022, Russia invades Ukraine war in Europe. This, what has been actually clear for Ukrainians since 2014, became very, very clear for the Western communities and states on February 24. And the direction was striking. Uh, the society decided to help us as soon as possible and as good as possible in order to receive the huge um, amount of people fleeing from the war, women, children, all the people but also the administration and the state uh, did it best in order to, um, uh, to support the refugees, but of course also to support the fighting Ukraine with humanitarian aid, with military aid and other ways of uh, support. This refugee wave is the biggest refugee crisis since at the end of the Second World War. It is bigger as the refugee crisis of 2016, 2015 in Europe. It is uh, a crisis that happens in a direct neighborhood of the European Union countries, and it affects the countries of the EU, but also of the whole Europe in an extent that hasn't been uh, experienced yet. Definitely not since the wound of the Second World War. The reaction was unexceptional. And I must say, if I would be the one who decides about the Nobel Peace Prize this year, I would give this Nobel Peace Prize to really the people, and the societies of Europe, of Poland, of Germany, of Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, other countries and Moldova. That, are, that received thousands or even millions of people within a very, very few days and gave them the possibility to stay, gave them shelter, gave them food, gave them medicines, things to wear, or just easy enabled transportation to other parts of Europe. This unexceptional support comes mainly from the very, very ordinary people drivers, school teachers, a friends of Ukraine, or people who never been to Ukraine or not even speak uh, uh, any foreign language, but they know that the tragedy that is happening now in Ukraine uh, is something that cannot be ignored. And as a human being, you have to support your clients in need. On the other side, 
which was very also good and what has to be talked about was the support of the local administration of people who decided to ignore the rules saying yes of course we are ready to welcome the refugees from ukraine with their pets we are welcome we are ready to welcome refugees without any documents we are ready to welcome people who um, are maybe technically not prepared to stay here but we have to do everything to help them and to receive them as good as possible in berlin over 500 doctors said that they are willing to receive ukrainians without any papers without any health insurance this is something that is happening now if you are in berlin you know you can go to a doctor and get support or medicine that you need There is, of course, a huge network of civil society organizations, of Ukrainian diaspora, of Polish diaspora, but also of other migrant communities who know how unease it is for somebody who is entering a country of, uh, and it doesn't speak the language, it doesn't know the reality, it has nothing, just a small bag of things with them or a pet or a child, or anything others. And um, and that is why I think the administration, both in Poland, but also in Germany, reacted very quickly, mobilized all the forces they had in order to register the people, in order to give them support, in order to facilitate the shelter and uh, other, um, other needs they have. But of course, the support is very limited. And I understand very well that there is a lot of criticism about what is going on in uh, on the stations, in the institutions, because, of course, the number of Ukrainians coming to Germany or coming to Poland is much, much more than the capacities of the people, of the society organizations or of the administration. And this is a huge challenge that we all have to tackle up on. And that is why uh, we need very, very strongly an European answer. We need joint solutions. We need to understand that the war in Ukraine is a challenge to all of us, to our, our community. And this is the time that we have to stand together and as we have to join forces and that we uh, have to receive the people, help Ukraine in fighting. On the other side, also to think about what the steps, what are the next steps that are ahead of us. Because after the easing down the current situation, there will be the question of economy, There will be question of work, there will be question of integration, of schools, of teaching, of uh, languages. And even maybe it is not the right time to think about in a complex, profound way. These are the questions that are need to be asked and should be answered in the next steps. Let's hope that the war in Ukraine will not will not. Uh, take a long time. Let's hope that the country can be quickly restored and rebuilt and that this um, memory of the refugee, of, of Ukrainian refugees coming to Europe will become our joint European memory and that will bring us together and help us jointly build a better future in peace, stability, and security. Slava Ukraina. Thank you very much. We continue our journey following the path of Ukrainian refugees and go from Germany to Canada and the US. Separated from Ukraine by a very large distance, they have not become a major hub yet. Nevertheless, some of the Ukrainians have already found themselves on this very new, very distant soil. So what are their challenges, what they should and shouldn't do? We talk about this with an immigration lawyer in Canada and the US and a great friend of Ukraine, uh, Mr. Хочу сьогодні дещо сказати про біженців до Канади і до Америки. 
і яке може стосуватися до українців, які втікають з України через війну. Питання, чи можна податися як біженець, щоб приїхати до Канади або до Америки? Відповідь – ні. Біженець мусить бути в Канаді або в Америці, щоб податися як біженець. Значиться, щоб дійти до статусу біженця, ми мусимо приїхати до Канади або до Америки в інакший спосіб. Через е, візиторську візу до Канади або до Америки. То є одинокий спосіб, як люди з України тепер, зараз, можуть приїхати до Канади або до Америки. Раджу вам, якщо ви б приїхали до Канади або до Америки, як візитори, не подаватися відразу, як біженець на границі. І не казати, що ви приїжджаєте з тим, що ви хочете бути біженець і зупинитися в Америці або в Канаді зараз. Треба вам перше, раз ви приїдете сюди, порадитися з імміграційними адвокатами, за які ви вносите таке подання, бо може бути шкідливе. Як це можливе? Ви можете спитати, що ви, як біженець з України, не можете податися на біженцевий статус в Канаді або в Америці. Це тому, що правниче зрозуміння, розуміння про біженець є інакше, ніж то, що звичайні люди знають. Щоб бути біженцем, треба доказати, що А. Ви є поза межами своєї країни, Б що ви маєте страх повернутися до своєї країни, далі В, чи як то, що цей страх має до діла з урядом, який є тепер на місці у своїй країні, значить, що тепер є український уряд ще, так що той за скоро вимагати статус біженця зараз тепер. Є війна, я розумію, але тепер є український уряд, який шанує українців і не загрожує їм. І далі ви мусите доказати, що ви боїтеся повернутися, бо ваш уряд буде вас переслідувати через дані вже визнані причини, наприклад, на базі расу, на базі політичної опині, на базі, базі релігії і так далі. Це є дуже тяжко доказати. І не є, вам може здається, що то дуже добре таке зробити, бо ви дістанете всі ті права, які біженець може дістати в Канаді чи в Америці, право на працю, право на медичну опіку, право на соціальну допомогу і так далі. Але повірте мені, вам треба приїхати як візитор, і раз ви є в Америці або в Канаді, Порадьтеся з імміграційним адвокатом, доки ви вийдете на таку, що, доки ви зробите таке подання. І я вірю, що зараз тепер не є добре подаватися як біженець, а просто сказати, що ви приїжджаєте до Канади чи до Америки як візитор по програмах, які існують, і ви хочете бути тут, значить, у Північній Америці через якийсь час, доки ситуація не е, успокоюється. Раз, раз все ніби прийде до нормального знову, тоді ви може або залишитися, або може повернутися назад на Україну. Я вірю, що багато хочуть повернутися до України, на Україну, якби війна стала і як все можна, якби повернулися до нормального. Починайте з від, візиторською ситуацією і не, не згадуйте про страх і що ви не хочете вертатися на Україну і так далі. Бо це не може, може не вийти на вашу користь пізніше. Раз, ви все будете мати право податися на біженцовий статус, раз ви є тут. Ви не мусите першого дня подаватися. Все буде можливо вам це податися. На тим я кінчаю і бажаю всього доброго. 
Having heard a professional opinion of a lawyer in great practical detail, we now look at the other side of the coin and talk to a person who acted as a host to the family of Ukrainian refugees. Please welcome Mrs. Agnieszka Bryk, a Polish filmmaker who tells a very personal story of Ukrainians she hosted, becoming a part of incredible Polish community that made so many of our people so welcome. So it all happened a couple of days after the war started. I saw uh, on Facebook text that a friend of mine, which I haven't seen for 10 years, she posted, I need a place to stay for my cousins and uh, and my best friend. So I said, okay, I'll take, I'll take these people. They are coming, they are escaping. So I, I, I waited for them for, I think, five days because they, instead of going straight to Poland, they went from Moldavia, Moldova, Romania and, and uh, Slo- Slovakia. Finally, they arrived and they stayed in my house. Uh, fortunately, I had a place to put them. I gave them the whole bedroom and three people stayed. And after a couple of days, uh, we, uh, I don't know, it just happened that we, we got the chance to find a job for one of the, one of the women who was a doctor. And uh, immediately it was like it was like a miracle because we, we talked to the to the person that was living in a lake district in Poland, like one hour, two hours and a half from Warsaw, and I got in touch with her by accident through some friends of her friends, and she says, "Oh, I need a doctor to come to to work in my in my clinic." And I said, well, I will have a doctor. So we talked on the, we, we talked here in this room for like 10 minutes. And the three of us, the, my, my Ukrainian doctor, the, the woman from the clinic and me. And she says, okay, so my husband will come and pick her up in two days. And we're like, what? <laughs> so it, 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 uh, it happened. So he came and picked, picked her up. She decided to go because she, she, she's, um, pediatrician, endocrinologist pediatrician, and they really needed such a, a specialty. And the two uh, other people, they are a couple, it's a couple over 60 years old. They are from Lviv. They stayed. They have plans to go to America to, uh, to, to their son who lives in Florida. So they stayed for one week here and Lviv was quite safe and not, nothing was happening there and uh, because she had something ra- wrong with her teeth and she had her teeth replaced some some um, some some stuff and they were waiting for her in Lviv they decided to go back there and uh, after one week I put them on the bus to back to Lviv to Ukraine which was so brave of them I mean it was just like it was a very emotional moment when I took them to the bus station and they said we'll, we'll be back they are not back yet but uh, we are in touch and I'm waiting for them to come back. The, her, her teeth are fixed. Uh, they are still wait, wa- waiting for their car to be fixed and then w- they will come back in their car. Also in the meantime, uh, my sis- uh, I had another Ukrainian couple in my house and it happened like this. My sister lives in Canada, she in Montreal, and she has some Ukrainian friends. And uh, one of her friends, her uh, son, he has a fiancé in Ukraine, in Irpin. And before the war, like one month or one and a half before the war, he came, he went to Irpien to get married with her, finally. And uh, it was postponed, the, the, the wedding was postponed a couple of times because both of them, them got COVID. And the third time that they had the uh, wedding scheduled was two days after the war broke. So the war broke on the 24th and they immediately escaped from Irpin to Kiev with that cat and uh, they were hiding in, in shelters in, uh, in Kiev and then the first possible uh, private transport they ran away from, from Kiev and uh, they uh, well because my sister called me and said well they can they can come here to my house because the Lvov uh, couple was going to Lvov so I can do the exchange so they came over here with that cat and they stayed for a couple of days. And um, because he's Canadian and he still has a job and he has resources, so they managed to rent a house in Warsaw. And she got a Canadian, I just got a, a message from him last yesterday that she got a Canadian visa and the cat uh, got the passport <laughs> to go to Canada, <laughs> which was not that easy and not that obvious. And uh, I don't know, they, soon they will be leaving to, to Montreal. 
One more voice from Poland, which is befitting, is this is the neighboring country that hosted the majority, more than 2 million of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, this voice belongs to a reporter and a writer, Mr. Andrzej Meller. He describes how a relatively small town has prepared for the uh, coming and arrival of Ukrainian refugees uh, who are fleeing the Russian war. And uh, he does it so that we can better imagine the hospitality of the Polish people. Please welcome him. Good evening. My name is Andrzej Meller. I'm a, I'm a reporter and a writer. Uh, and since two years, I live in a, um, at the border with Belarus, um, near the city of Sokulka. As far as I know, there are around 230 women and children right now in our big city which is inhabited by around 20,000 people. The Ukrainian refugees, they stay with the Polish families in good conditions. The Polish Red Cross has sent a truck with dry food and the local city hall is paying for lunches at the school canteen for uh, the refugees. They can also go swimming at the swimming pool. They have free uh, film screening in the movie theater and today uh, we attended me and my wife a ceramic uh, workshop for Ukrainian refugees. As far as I know mm, the local people uh, are uh, uh, providing uh, medical care for them. For example my what we do uh, ourselves. My wife is uh, organizing on Tuesday a gong concert that will help them to relax. I will have a show uh, soon I will talk about my work, I will show pictures from uh, different uh, spots in the world. Um, so I think people are doing what they can, uh, they, they are um, open-hearted for the Ukrainians. Of course the language is, is, is a bit a problem, but as far as I know the Ukrainian refugees soon will be able to learn Polish, uh, it will be organized by the city hall. After this impassioned address, God bless the people of Poland, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, my brilliant colleague and a friend, Maxim Budkevich, with whom at peaceful times we've traveled so many cities of Ukraine that right now are under shelling and living through the sounds of airstrike alerts. Maxim Budkevich, before joining brave men and women who protect uh, our motherland with arms in their hands, has dedicated more than 10 years of of his life uh, to assisting refugees coming to Ukraine. And now he gives us an overview of how the tables have turned. And he also addresses the bigger issues regarding the refugee policy in the European Union. Let's welcome him. So it's been one month since Russia launched full-scale invasion into Ukrainian Popa. And uh, this is a nightmarish month. This was and this continues to be a totally nightmare situation while Russian Federation armed forces effectively wage genocidal war. And this is no exaggeration against Ukrainian people, against Ukrainian civilian population, peaceful cities bombing and shelling them, killing civilians discriminately with missiles and uh, attempting to take over main Ukrainian cities of the east, north, center, and south of Ukraine. In this crisis, we are witnessing the largest uh, forced migration of people in Europe since World War II. Right now, as we see, more than 10 million Ukrainians had to leave their homes. Up to 4 million of them became refugees meaning crossed international borders and uh, more than uh, six million persons had to move inside the country trying to find shelter in uh, safer western Ukrainian cities and towns. This is a huge crisis. This is a huge test for the whole asylum system of uh, neighboring countries, primarily countries of the European Union. What we've witnessed, the decision to grant temporary protection 
to Ukrainians in all EU countries is definitely a historical event. It never happened before. And basically, uh, this is something uh, I personally welcome wholeheartedly because this goes against all logic of uh, what has been dubbed by those who criticized European asylum policy fortress Europe. Instead of hardening the borders, the European Union, in spirit of solidarity, basically let people through even without international travel documents since they really needed shelter and they really needed asylum. Also, solidarity of people in different European countries, host communities, host cities, the universities is amazing. It is amazing. And of course, uh, I think as most of Ukrainians, all of Ukrainians, I'm personally deeply grateful. But of course, while analyzing the situation, we should keep in mind several things. After spending 16 years of my life trying to assist refugees from other countries, both neighboring and uh, distant, I cannot help it but to ask the question, what about uh, nationals of uh, other countries who have to flee war and destruction in their homelands? Should European asylum policy be discriminatory or should it be uniformed and really fulfill obligations to help refugees no matter what their country of origin is? Second, it is really fortunate and really uh, helpful that uh, European neighboring countries did not have to deal with uh, Ukrainian refugee uh, influx alone, the whole European Union became a shelter zone. This is really important and this goes again against the logic of Dublin regulations which were criticized so heavily uh, by human rights defenders inside the European Union as well as uh, abroad. And third, we definitely need to look forward. A lot of people had to leave Ukraine in first days and weeks of war, of uh, current war in a full-scale Russian invasion, but primarily these were vulnerable groups. These were uh, young mothers with uh, little kids. These were elderly people. Very often these were people who speak no uh, language spoken in the European Union and people who, let's uh, be frank, cannot really survive by themselves as uh, ordinary citizens in the situation of free market economies. It looks like we need to plan not for days or weeks, but at least for several months in order not to leave anyone who needs care and who needs assistance behind. Those who would be able or who are able to uh, sustain themselves, especially male part of uh, population, stayed in Ukraine and went to join the armed forces or territorial defense. So we are talking, uh, when we're talking about Ukrainian refugees, we are talking primarily about uh, more vulnerable groups who are in need of continuous assistance. And this, I believe, firmly should be a starting point for any planning of the next steps to uh, sustain and to assist these people. And of course, last but not least, uh, the sooner Russian Federation and its leadership is stopped uh, and uh, expulsed from Ukraine and uh, Russian imperialist policy of mass killing uh, of people in neighboring countries this time in Ukraine is made impossible. The sooner this refugee difficult situation or if you want uh, use refugee crisis will be over. So a lot, a lot depends on uh, politics, uh, more uh, and tougher sanctions against Russia and more and more needed assistance, including military assistance, 
to Ukraine assistance in defeating invaders. You have listened to the episode of Ukraine in Flames, a project about the Russian war against Ukraine brought to you by three uh, organizations, Euro- uh, Ukraine Crisis Media Center, NGO Euro Atlantic Course, and Ukraine Catholic University's Analytical Center. Uh, in order to stay tuned, please subscribe to our channel and stay informed. In the description to this video, you can find some hopefully helpful information on how you personally can help Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. If you find our job useful, I hope so, uh, please like and share this video. And while you do this, remember that everything is going to be Ukraine.